all of my advice was built for just half of the business cycle. That was the problem. And I'd done exactly the thing everyone had told me to. I had leveraged up, I bought residential real estate, I was using debt, I was aggressive in my portfolio because I was young. And I saw the massive shortcomings of not being what I now call a full cycle entrepreneur. everybody what's up welcome to go live with joshua scott i'm your host this is episode number 16 and guys man today i'm really really excited i've got uh, alistair mcdonald here say hi to everybody alistair good to see everybody great to be here um if i had a list of my most favorite people number one there would probably be a lot of people on it but alistair would be on this list for sure um and haven't haven't known you very long. I mean, a couple of years for sure. And, and then mostly just start off interacting with conferences. But um, give everybody you have such an interesting background. And, and I don't know that our our audience has had much exposure to you. So I'd love for you to just give a little bit of your story, kind of journey. And there's so much. I mean, we could talk about that the whole time. But like, give some highlights from that, and, and kind of how you landed here, even in the dental profession now. That is, that is a strange twist to the tale, for sure. <laughs> um, no, I've, I've always enjoyed our conversations and interactions. I remember you and Joanne and I having lunch at VOD a year and a half ago. Yeah. Um, and, and just interesting times. So it's, it's, yeah. it's definitely great to have crossed paths, and I've always enjoyed our interactions and that with your lovely bride. She's a, she's a sweetheart. Yes. Um, so I'm originally from Zimbabwe in Africa. I was born when it was Rhodesia. And I grew up during a, a, a very, very brutal civil war that lasted uh, the first eight or nine years of my life. In, in terms of the lag on effects, it lasted essentially 12 years of my life. Uh, and those are very formative years for me. Um, I was born and raised into a family of entrepreneurs. My family its only ever really worked for themselves. Uh, so much so that siblings wouldn't work together and have their own businesses and so forth. And it was nothing fabulous about this. It was just a matter of uh, nothing expected, but it was somewhat assumed that I would do something. It didn't matter what, but it would be my own thing. And, uh, you know, I grew up sitting around the dining room table as my father had, listening to him talk through his balance sheets and inventory that he had and what sort of turnover he needed to get his ROI and so forth as a little kid sitting there learning it, as I did for my grandfather, who had a number of businesses uh, and significant uh, uh, livestock at one point, nearly 9,000 head of cattle, almost a million acres of land that he owned or leased. And so I grew up listening to these people that I just adored and admired. And so when I was 18, I started my first business. It was a safari business. Um, And strangely, uh, the, the luxury of timing uh, was on my side, and that business boomed. And by the time I was 21, I was leading uh, source to sea expeditions for National Geographic. Uh, I was leading film crews and doing actual expeditions. Uh, in the case of the, the Zambezi River, for example, I did a six month expedition, it was a cover story for National Geographic. And I was just a kid. Wow. You know, 21, you don't really know very much. But so all of this, this rapid. Uh, excitement and cash and beautiful lifestyle. And I thought I was amazing. Um, I was pretty sure that, you know, I was God's gift. And, uh, and I was then, that was quickly, I was disabused of that. So why we became the fastest imploding economy in history. Uh, Inflation skyrocketed to 18 million percent. And this meant, for example, that if you played what this, this is the velocity of money, how quickly it moves through a system and this gets into some of the issues that we're dealing with today in the economy. When you, if you had employees as I had, and as my family had, if you, what you paid, you had to pay them twice a day because what you paid them at lunchtime wouldn't buy them dinner that night. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you ordered food at a restaurant, you paid when you ordered it because by the time it arrived, it cost more. Wow. Uh, that's the kind of inflation. It was the greatest hyperinflation in world history. Wow. Uh, and so navigating that, I came to the United States I assumed that those issues, those economic economic cycles, the violence of them were unique to third world economies. And uh, I moved to the United States and I got involved in the investment business and very quickly became absorbed with my own magic uh, and got heavily loaded up on tech stocks and rental properties and so forth. And the 
the crisis, uh, the tech bubble bursting of 2001, 2002, just ruined me, almost ruined me. I wasn't mm-hmm. bankrupt, but um, it culminated in a very, very brutal experience that uh, where, you know, I, I bought these properties. I was the primary income provider for my family. We had a little one-year-old baby girl, now 17, 18, rather. Um, Abby and uh, other colonists with you, Josh, this is what happened. I was living on the East Coast and had gone back out to Colorado to visit some friends where I'd previously been living. And we were, my portfolios had imploded. Our clients' assets had fallen 50% through the tech bubble wreck. And we were trying to take comfort from the fact that the NASDAQ fell 76. But saying to somebody, you've only lost half your money and everyone else has lost three quarters of it is little consolation. <laughs> so I felt professionally like a massive failure uh, and personally like one. So it culminated with me visiting some friends, uh, a very successful interventional radiologist and his wife in this beautiful home in the foothills of Colorado. And we, we said, I'd say we'd, I'd go grocery shopping and we'd make this nice big dinner. They're real foodies and what have you. And so I go to the grocery store and I load up on, you know, all these great groceries and stuff and come back bottles of wine, blah, blah, blah. And I go to check out and my card doesn't work. Mm. It's not good for however many hundreds of dollars that I was spending. And I remember looking at my wife and she had our one-year-old daughter, 18-month-old daughter on her hip with a little bag of carrots that she had already opened. And the shame and the shame that I felt yeah. was so unbelievably powerful as a provider, as a professional, I'd failed my clients. I'd failed my wife, myself, my daughter. Uh, it was horrific. And so I, you know, embarrassingly, as people are lining up behind me, I had to put certain groceries back and whatever it was that had happened, my deposit that was coming in wasn't enough. I was living paycheck to paycheck. As an expert, as somebody that knew the investment world, this is deeply shameful for me. And I'll never forget, I walked out of that grocery store. It was a Thursday morning and it was this kind of cool winter's morning in Colorado. And I stood there and I looked at my wife and my daughter and I said to myself, this will never happen again. This will never happen again. I'm never, ever going to do what I did and put myself and my family and my clients in such danger. Yeah. And that was a catalyst for me that uh, I went back and I said, what is it? How did, I, how did I get here? And how I got here was listening to experts, advisors, agents, economists, forecasters, etc. And all of my advice was built for just half of the business cycle. That was the problem. And I'd done exactly the thing everyone had told me to. I had leveraged up, I bought residential real estate, I was using debt, I was aggressive in my portfolio because I was young. And I saw the massive shortcomings of not being what I now call a full cycle entrepreneur. Yeah. And I spent the next three years getting essentially a PhD in 350 years of economic history and business research and case studies to figure out what it was that would protect me. And I was able to deploy that. And I was in the direct asset management business. And that allowed me, together with my experiences back in the whipsawing of the third world economy, to anticipate and profit from the US housing bubble and its bursting uh, and the financial crisis. It was the most profitable time of my life. Wow. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I got to now. How did you, because um, I want to, I want to jump into that because I, I remember distinctly a, a session, a conference a couple of years ago where I heard you speak for the first time, but you, you were actually talking about this then. How did you, what got you into dentistry and even specifically got you connected with, with Mark Costas and the DSI group? Yeah. So I'm just turning this down so we don't get interrupted. No, you're good. Um, so I, uh, at the time was, and continue to, uh, I moved out of the direct asset management business and sold out this fund that I was measured to my partner in 2015. And I took with me a core group of clients. I realized that I, there were two kinds of clients that I was catering to at the time and managing assets for. The one was the wealthy old blue bloods of America, uh, heirs of the DuPont family and JP Morgan and so forth, multi-generational wealth. And on the other side, I was handling the assets for entrepreneurs and giving them advice about their business. And so there's somebody that 
but by the age of 20, I had more employees than years of my life. Mm-hmm. I've made every possible mistake we could make. And what I realized is the world that I was living in was split right down the center. And those that were the blue bloods were fearful, distrustful, tentative, reticent to make decisions, second guess themselves and me. And those that were the entrepreneurs didn't hesitate. They executed. They did exactly what I recommended. They owned their own results just as I do. And I realized that this was a difference between those who inherited their wealth and those who created it. There are people that receive and there are people that create. And I realized that I'm living in the wrong world by even spending 50% of my attention. I, I don't have anything in common with these people. Yeah. Just as I don't with any presidential candidates right now. Yeah. They don't represent anything about me, my ideals, my interests, my needs. And I pivoted directly toward just working with entrepreneurs because our work would always reach into their businesses, not just their assets. Uh, and over time, uh, our mutual friend, Dr. Mark Costas, became one of those clients. And he was the segue for me. I owned a veterinary hospital that I bought in 2015. Uh, it was a tiny clinic back then. And um, I still had clients that I advised, but Mark was the one who brought me into dentistry. Okay. Because the stuff that we were talking about, the four futures, all of these things, he was deploying to the mastermind. And, uh, and that became an opportunity for me to get a black belt in dentistry very quickly with yeah. really high-performing people. So that's, that's how I got. <laughs> yeah. Nice, nice. Well, it, yeah, it, it, much like me, I mean, I've, I've, I started off in a different career and had to kind of took a hard left turn into dentistry. And so I think that those stories are interesting for sure. When I first uh, met you, uh, it was, you were on the stage. It was Mark's conference, the Dental Success Summit. It was March of 2018. And at that time, your session on the stage, I mean, you pretty much predicted this. Um, and you would probably say it's not so much prediction as it was just the facts lining up. Um, but you even kind of put a little bit of a time frame on it being last fall, like fourth quarter of last year. And so you're off by a little bit, but I remember at the time listening to you and being fascinated by it because we were, I don't know at that time if we were in the longest bull run or if it was trending that way, um, but just the logic that you laid out was, was compelling. And so, so take us back to that, you know, March of 2018 and what you were saying about this back then. So uh, certainly what I didn't do was anticipate or predict COVID-19 by any right. stretch. Yeah. Uh, what I was cautioning about And the reason that I chose that as the message that I wanted to share then is having been, having worked for myself for 27, 28 years, I know that owning a business is very much like selling a home. It's not a stock you buy or sell. These pivots take a long time. It's like turning around an oil tanker versus a speedboat. Mm -hmm. And so what I wanted to do, my idea, every time I'd speak or something, I want to be able to like, what will make the biggest difference for these people Regardless of how long it takes, I just want to make the biggest difference. Um, I care more about impact than reach, you know. And yeah. I thought this will be high impact for them is to know that we are now inside then within months of being the longest economic expansion in U.S. history. And I was cautioning that the longer this goes on, the worse it's likely to be. And that's just the nature of bulls and, and, and bulls and bears, booms and busts. Yeah. The longer the boom, the harder or longer the bust. That's just the nature of things. This is the fractal pattern of the universe. The way pine cones expand or coastlines look similar, uh, that's the same thing that happens with uh, economic cycles. So I was cautioning that as a business owner, and where I, I specifically made a date, which nobody ever does, uh, and you can see why, because you, I had nothing to gain except reputational risk. There's yeah. nothing to gain for me. Um, it was truly me trying to say, hey, I own businesses, you own businesses. I recommended that everybody start to anticipate and be ready for, and I explicitly said, be ready for either, uh, for a recession on or by October of 2019. And the premise was not that the it would begin exactly on October 6, 2019 or whatever. Yeah. It's that you would be ready for a recession by then. And those, uh, those of my private clients that I work with are the kind of people that aren't afraid of things like that. 
they understand that there's no good news or bad news. There's just news you were prepared for and news you weren't prepared for. And so these are intellectually courageous people because they're willing to hear a different narrative. They're willing to actually run scenarios instead of just rely on hope. And they've made those changes and they are killing it. This yeah. is their time to shine. Um, and so the whole premise was that no opinion is required. I don't need to pretend to be a clairvoyant. I don't, I'm just a student of history. And I'm saying, guys, we are bumping up against historical precedent. And the longer this goes, the surer we can be that a recession is closer and closer. Yeah. Um, and so that's how that transpired. The truth is, for those that were prepared by October, often they're not looking back and saying, I prepared too soon. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, when, when a true, when an impact of a recession like this happens, no amount of preparation is considered too much or too soon. It just isn't. Yeah. I would have to imagine, because I mean, dentistry has been very opportunistic the last couple years. I mean, three, five, you know, I mean, and, and I, from my perspective, I didn't, any capital that was sitting around, so to speak, was probably being invested back, whether it was technology, whether it was expanding locations, whether it was hiring extra cl clinicians, like just this expansion opportunistic boom that was happening in dentistry. Um, even at that time, I would imagine, I mean, when you got, when you stepped off the stage, was that received well? Was that, um, did you get any pushback? Was No, historically, because I've been through this many times, uh, when I was warning about the housing bust, uh, I lost clients. Uh, people yeah. said, yeah, I don't want to hear this. They, were so, they had this sunk cost mindset. Uh, not a lot of them, but uh, likewise, when I was warning about the financial crisis in August of 07 and saying, you know, companies like Lehman Brothers and Washington Mutual, they won't exist two years from now. Yeah. Um, those that have what I think of as intellectual dynamism are not afraid of these things. And they want to know, e even if it's just to factor into their scenarios, it doesn't need to be high probability if it's high impact. Yes. So if it's a 5% probability, but it's a 100% loss, it needs to be at the top of your list. Hmm. Yeah. If it's low, if it's high probability, an 80% probability, but it's 10% impact, that can slide down the list. So um, I had a number of people that came up to me afterwards and said, thanks, that's what I needed to, I wasn't, I've never heard this before. It's certainly not in dentistry. Yeah. Because dentistry, I could definitely go on about this and I should, It'd probably be a little more measured, but uh, dentistry is, or as all industries do, saturated, uh, as we always are, late cycle with a very distinct sense of exceptionalism, mm. that there is something about us that it just makes us remarkably magical, precious, uh, blah, blah, blah. And there's evidence of that. Uh, that very afternoon, there was a panel on the stage, and there was a young doc, very aggressive, very successful, who had only ever owned and come out of school during the boom years, yeah. had no full cycle experience. Uh, and they'd said, well, what do you make of Alistair's uh, anticipation of a recession here within the next couple of years? How's that impact your plans? And this person, unfortunately, said, I'm not worried about that at all because dentistry is recession proof. <laughs> right. And what a, I remember standing there as many moments in my life have happened, and I think this is a profound moment. And I won't know why until the future, yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, so I've had, I've been laughed off, booed off stages. I gave a, uh, a speech to a, a group on the East Coast organized by an Ivy League university there in late 05, where I was talking about this housing boom was a bubble and it was going to end badly. And I got all these same things like, oh, you don't understand. You know, uh, everybody needs a home. Sure, uh, no one's making any more land. Everybody's moving here for the lifestyle. Now, what they didn't realize is that all of my clients all over the country were also telling me that everyone's moving there for the lifestyle as well. Yeah. Uh, apparently, that's what everyone was doing, moving everywhere for the lifestyle. Right. Uh, this is preposterous. But these are, these are what in psychology we call framing. I come up with an emotionally derived appetite for something. And I build this logical framework. So my limbic system is what drives me to make the decision. And then I feel stupid saying to you, well, I just feel good about it or feel bad. So I make up this convoluted case. And some of it is obvious. 
uh, it's true that everyone needs a house, but do they need to pay five times the household income to have one? Right. It's true that no one's making any more land, but does that mean you need a 6,000 square foot home when you know, you're, you're living on $50,000 a year? You know, these are preposterous. And so to a certain extent, I'd, sorry, try not to sneeze. Uh, <laughs> to a certain extent, um, we've seen this in dentistry where a lot of docs are saying, well, everyone needs the dentist and you've always got to go to the dentist and uh, everyone has teeth and everyone, yeah, so this is all true. Right. But does this mean we should be paying 18 times EBITDA for a clinic? Right, right. It doesn't at all. Yeah, so, I, I think, no, I think you're totally right on that because um, what I've kind of seen over the last handful of years is, um, I, I think a couple of things. I think you could be a good clinician and probably build a decent, stable dental practice. I also think the current situation of the economy in the last five to 10 years, you may not be a good business owner and you could have a successful dental practice. Yeah. And so I think there was a lot of like success in spite of maybe your skills of business leader or a business operator. And so if you're not careful, you misjudge that. And if you don't have that self-awareness, you're like, I'm awesome. And what I saw this is when with expansion, like you would have a single doctor build a successful practice, some of it because he's a good clinician and the economy's awesome, but then think that translates to practice two and to practice three and it didn't necessarily do that. And by practice three, now it's a massive leadership issue and business operation issue and they may find themselves struggling. Um, yeah. So I, I love that you said that. When, when people, when you start to see this type of opportunism, is that, is that like a, a signal? I mean, whether it's housing, whether it's financial, whether it's dental, sure. you go... It's a bubble? Yeah, that, that is a distinct feature of late cycle economics and finance and business. Okay. It's always a feature of it. Uh, and so how it manifests is it's, it's rooted in this fear of missing out and mm -hmm. fear of being left behind. Uh, in bull markets, in expansions, we move through, we live in a world of what's called relative performance. So I ask myself, uh, how, not how am I doing uh, just for my own goals, but how am I doing versus Josh? How am I doing versus the S and P 500? Yeah. How am I, et cetera. This is that competitive fear of missing out that shows up in all of it. People say, well, you know, how many leads does that practice? How many new patients are they getting, etc." cetera. Uh, and then when we move into the contractionary cycle, we realize that our goals are actually ours and not someone else's. Yeah. And we start cutting away the excess. And one of the first things we cut away is the, uh, the, this envious greed-based operating system and we move into survival mode. And suddenly then our comparison that was previously relative now becomes total. So instead of saying, how have I done versus the S&P, they say, how have I done versus nothing? Hmm. How have I done versus cash? Yeah. Uh, how have I done versus my vision of success or what have you? Uh, and this is the shift. There are a number of psychological shifts that happen through the full market cycle. And, you know, you joked earlier that you hadn't heard of me and stuff. I'm often, I often get given a hard time for being black ops. I don't, you know, I don't have a particularly an appetite for building an audience or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most of podcast. But uh, it's largely because it takes a certain kind of person that even understands what it means to be what I refer to as a full cycle entrepreneur. Hmm. It takes a certain kind of person that says, no, I'm playing the long game. So those dentists, as you refer to, that were aggressively going from one to five practices in three years, were typically, they weren't doing it for the income and the revenue. They were doing it for the big sale yeah. so they can sell and kick back on the beach. This is bull market psychology run amok. Yeah. This sense that it is, and we know this because the entire plan, is deeply rooted in growth. Every assumption has an embedded component of ex exponential and enduring growth. This is a critical thing. If you are in business, you are in the forecasting business. I don't care whether you sell, let's say that you sell a, a restaurant furniture. When you decide to expand your inventory, build out your warehouse, bring on another employee, bring on another op, expand your hygiene, buy another practice. It doesn't matter what it is. You are making a forecast, but it's actually not a forecast. It's simply a projection. The difference between a forecast and a projection is a projection is rooted entirely in the data that supports an ongoing trend. 
<clears throat> we take what has worked and we project it out into the future. This is not a forecast. Hmm. A forecast takes into account all of the data, the complete market cycle. Yeah. And in the case of dentistry, we have to look outside of just our industry, which unfortunately, and I say it's unfortunate, because this, is, this lesson lies ahead for many people. Unfortunately, dentistry only saw about a 10 or 12% contraction in the, last, in, the, in the crisis. And this gives us a sense of really deeply embedded exceptionalism. And while it's true that everybody needs a dentist, and it's true that everyone has a mouth and so forth, none of this says anything about the fear of a pandemic, of a virus, or I would suggest long-term, even more dangerously, hot money. Hot money shows up late in the cycle and leverages itself off the cliff. Hmm. And it only does this all the time. It does, did it in housing. It's done it in mortgages. It's done it in tech stocks, in mining, in tobacco, in agriculture, in finance. I mean, it's 15 industries that I've been involved in. I see it all the time. So one of the things I've been cautioning about more recently in the last 15 months, every time I speak at events and so forth, is I understand that this hot money, this 15, 16, 18 times EBITDA sales is new and exciting to you, but it's not new. Yeah. It's just new to you. Yeah. Uh, and and it, it tends to end the same way. It doesn't, these people aren't buying practices because they care about oral health. Right. right. They care about the yield. They didn't buy uh, collateralized mortgage obligations because they wanted Americans to have homes. No, they yeah. wanted the yield. Yeah. Well, um, I love that. We, we definitely got some, some viewers on. So if you guys are, are jumping on the live, say hi, so we can, we can see that you're out there and give a shout out. Um, when I think some of what I, and I see people get caught up in is trying to, I, cause I don't think anybody would have predicted this was COVID. I mean, very few people would have predicted a public health threat and going back to the, the guy on stage with you on the panel that said dentistry is recession proof. There is a little bit of, of historical data to, so dentistry has always done better in a recession for the most part, but that was before we had a public health crisis that shut us yeah. all down. But I, I also heard what you said when we were talking before we jumped on live was like, it's less about the catalyst and it's more about the cycles that are predicting it. And if we get caught up in predicting like, well, everything's so good, what could possibly derail this? You kind of keep putting it off because you can't foresee that, but then you ignore the cycle and the history. Yeah, completely. Uh, there is, and this is where I keep referring to the intellectually courageous, you know, the people willing to hear different opinions. There's not many of them. There's not many out there. And I had to become one through the school of hard knocks. Uh, I loved my story about how I was going to be a massive rental landlord and uh, all the rest. It took a huge pivot for me in 05 to look up and say, this is a bubble and I'm selling and I'm selling my properties and I'm renting and so forth. I was rewarded. Because within nine months, I was living in a five-bedroom home on the ocean with a private beach uh, and uh, views of the water from every room in the house. And I was paying less than the property taxes to do that. Wow. I lived there with my family for nearly four years. Nothing amazing about me. But there is about, uh, about adopting and, and grabbing the full cycle entrepreneurial perspective. Um, the... The public health thing, absolutely, that, that's a standalone issue for dentistry. And I'm afraid right now a lot of people are turning to collective organizations, the ADA and so forth, to solve that. Bureaucrats always show up after the horse has fled the barn and closed the door. The, the help is not on the way. And so it's on us to, to solve things. And that's what we do, entrepreneurs. We solve problems. Yeah. We solve problems for people and they pay us money. That's what we do. Um, what do you see? Obviously, we, we've, I feel like we've got two different issues here. We've got the public health crisis and how dentistry kind of bounces back from that. And th but then I think, you know, we're, we're also, I think everybody feels like we're w going into a recession. And, and maybe technically, I, I think last time I heard, like, we're technically not in a recession because we just don't have the length of time, but everybody's expecting that. What do you see on both those fronts? How do you see dentistry bouncing back from this? What do you see the effects of the economy the rest of this year? Well, I've got a lot about that to share. Um, the, the truth is that 68% uh, of, um, uh, we're absolutely in a recession. The reason there's a delay is the NBER, the National Bureau of Economic Research, is the organization that is uh, it, uh, burdened with or, or entitled to call an official recession. And they typically do it. There's a number of measures they use, but for the most part, it's two quarters of declining GDP. 
Now, two quarters, that's six months. This means that we will only know that they were, they were right or right. in recession at best five or six months late. Right. Um, so of GDP, about 68% is consumer, is the U.S. consumer, okay. individual consumption. The remaining 32% is manufacturing, shipping, supply lines, service industries, uh, capital expenditures, and so on and so forth. As, uh, as it turns out, Every single one of those other 32% components, the, the, the heavy lifting of uh, the economic indicators, all turned down in October of 2019. Hmm. And I have a bunch of charts that I can share with you to show you exactly that. Because I had to go back and say, okay, how wrong am I? Uh, in January, I, g- I gave an update. I'm responsible for everything that I say. Um, and... The, the courage or stupidity to put myself out there and say, you know, be ready for it by October. I had to look back and say, am, am I off track? And I gave this presentation at one of Mark's events in January showing all of this background data, specifically when I cautioned about it. Every single one of these indicators rolled over in the, in the fourth quarter of 2019. So it's coming into this, we were already experiencing what's called a CapEx or a capital expenditure contraction. Uh, which is what I was anticipating. Large corporations cutting back on benefits, new phone systems, software, offices, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And now we've got 26 million Americans unemployed in the last month. So this, finally, this 68, 70% component of GDP is, it, we're talking about, we've gone from 3.5% unemployment, which you and I were talking about back in at the VOD a year ago. And I was saying, yeah. We were talking about how hard it is to find qualified candidates. Yeah. Uh, and I said, unfortunately, this is one of the pain points of entrepreneurship late in the cycle. And if we can hang in there, we're going to get an army of qualified people showing up to do business with us. Hmm. Sure enough, unemployment peaked in January at 3.5%. And is now, as of today's numbers, another four and a quarter million people without jobs. Uh, we've gone to from three and a half to probably over 20% in the space of a month. So to put that into context, at its peak, unemployment in the, uh, the Great Depression of the 1930s was at 24.9 percent. Wow. This suggests that we are effectively in a depression, or one lies ahead. Yeah. Uh, now again, I'm not worried about this. My clients aren't worried about this. We're ready. We're yeah. ready. And that's, that's what I want people to be. I want them to be ready. Yeah. Yeah. And I love- it's not too late. It's not too late. Okay. Okay. What do you see? What do you see? Because in some, there was part of this where I'm, I'm looking at. It, I'm like, it was kind of this like self-imposed, you know, in re- recession or it's just kind of locked down. Do you see it bouncing back fast, or can you shut down an economy like just come to a hard stop like that without seeing years worth of effects? Yeah, those are great questions. Uh, the difference between a recession and a depression typically speaking, is a recession, and this comes around to your question, is a recession typically causes sector-specific pain. So the mortgage industry emerged differently. The okay. tech industry emerged differently. The financial services business emerged differently yeah. over the last couple of crises. A depression causes systemic industrial shifts throughout industry and systemic behavioral shifts in consumers' appetites, uh, instinct for risk, a pension for savings, all of these things. This is what marks it. So the, the thing to watch is the national savings rate, which I expect to hit double digits within the next two months. It's currently at 6%. You can find it on the St. Louis Fed, the St. Louis Federal Reserve. If you just have St. Louis Fed, uh, U.S. savings rate, and this is something to watch as a canary in the coal mine for our friends that have businesses that are trying to cater to consumers' appetites. Um, what what is different about this? Um, the idea of can we just shut down? Certainly, a lot of this has been caused by governmental quarantine stuff. A significant portion of it, undoubtedly. But we have to ask ourselves: What have these people learned? What they've realized is that they were, I, I believe, it's somewhere in the order of seventy-eight percent of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. These are the same people that have been laid off on mass in the last couple of weeks. Uh, if just this morning I was breaking apart the data on who these people are, a friend and client said to me, can we get a breakdown of who these unemployed people are? It's a great question. And sure enough, for the most part, it's women between the ages of 22 and 30 that are, 
um, that may or may not have children, that may or may not be married. For the most part, they're single. These are, of course, ladies that work in the restaurant business, assistants, yeah. hygienists, office workers, and dentistry, etc. Um, so the question becomes, what scar has formed here or will be formed with this experience? Those same 78% of Americans that are living paycheck to paycheck, as I was in 2001, are looking up and saying, just as I did, this will never happen again. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to be one paycheck away from insolvency. And so this is where the savings rate comes back up. Okay. Uh, a pension for buying what is needed versus what is wanted. Uh, so the rise in need for deeper clinical skills, but not in the frivolous, we could call it frivolous, elective ends of the marketplace. Do they, yes, they need help. Do they really need an implant or dentures work? Uh, do they need veneers or not? Do they need Invisalign or not? So we need to cater uh, our skill set, our offerings, our pricing, and our structure accordingly. So in a sense, you're saying the economy may not reboot as fast as the politicians and the CNNs and Fox News are saying because actually what's going to grow is a U.S. savings rate because people are going to become more conservative, which means that's not cash back into the economic system. And that's exactly the problem. Yeah. 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 Now, bear in mind, this is an election year or a re-election year for some people. It is in every politician's interest to say, don't worry, it'll be over soon. Yeah. I, there is, uh, I could share some charts with you I just did um, a a training about upgrading people's investment understanding on Monday with a friend of mine, Dr. Andrew Turchin, and I showed the U.S. housing bubble and specific quotes from Bernanke, Hank Paulson, and these people as the market imploded. Housing, for example, had fallen 5% when Hank Paulson said he thinks that the bottom is in and prices are steady again. They went on to fall another 32% from there. Hmm. Bernanke uh, said explicitly in July of 2005, I see no reason why we should get a national sell-off in home prices because uh, it's never happened. What he means is it hasn't happened in his lifetime. It yeah. It's never happened. Yeah. So th- there is a narrative here. There's a conflict of interest. They have to try to convince us that all is well. And this gets to the, the, the beauty of your second question is, will we get the bounce back? There will definitely, in the case of dentistry, be a latent demand that's building up for people that are in pain or what have you. But to assume that they will come back for Invisalign and not want to haggle or negotiate, I think is is a bold a bold plan. So I expect an initial surge where people maybe can go to the dentist that want to. Okay. But for sure, their appetites will be structurally uh, impaired by this uh, this experience. Then we have to say well, what do we do? Like, what do, what do legislators do and so forth? Here's the critical component of this particular recession, possibly depression, is this is rooted in fears of financial, but now physical security, physical safety. Yeah. You cannot legislate around fear. You can't legislate around fear. You can't say to people, no, no, it's absolutely, you know, you must go back to the dentist or you must get veneers or you, you it's safe to go there. You can tell me that all you like. If I'm standing, if we're in a packed movie theater and we smell smoke and I go and stand in the doorway and say, no, don't worry about it. We've got the best smoke detectors and, and sprinkler system in the city. You will be yeah. trampled. Right. Because you cannot use logical solutions to an emotional problem. Yeah. And this is what dentistry faces. And I'm working actively with my clients to say, how can we get in front of this? Uh, and I've got a number of ideas about how they can do it uh, to anticipate this fear. Okay. You mean, so, so obviously here in the next couple months, the having it, well in, in the rest of the year, having some other solutions, you know, if not an implant dentures, if not this, then, then that, what are, what are a few other kind of things top of mind thinking about, especially the next two to three months reopening in particular of how, what should dentists be expecting? What are you foreseeing? Um, what, what can they do to help get through this? The Achilles heel is hygiene. Hygiene is the issue. It's absolutely non-essential. I mean, dentists might be convinced it is, but the populace is not. Yeah. We know that because we have yeah. to call them and tell them to come in. Okay? <laughs> right. So uh, we have to say, hey, listen, don't worry. It's totally safe. That's, again, I'm trying to solve an emotional concern with a logical solution. Yeah. Uh, that's not going to work. We need a different approach. And I've got much to share about that, but I'm sure we don't have time for it. But is so i want to get hygiene in the door 
and I've got to convince them it's totally safe and so forth. And uh, they're going to say, some of them at least, what percentage? I don't know. If it's 10%, it's a big deal because hygiene represents a third of their revenue. Yeah. So if 10% says, mm, I'm not going to come in, I'm going to just buy some more, uh, buy some dental floss at Costco, one of those water pick things on Amazon, and I'll do it myself. And they're about 60 or 70% right. They yeah. can. They can do about that much on their own. Uh, and so what this is going to cause is downstream uh, effects of long-term health implications for people because of their fear of coming uh, to the dentist. I anticipate a bit of a wave of resentment for dentistry because I don't want this to be true, but I'm, I'm gaming this out so that I'm prepared in case it is. It's not my, it's not my, it's not my hope, but it is an expect a, a plan. You make a plan, then I don't have to worry. Yeah. Um, the pushback when people start to get reminded by the ridiculous media that dentistry is really dangerous. And my aunt Pam got really sick after blah, blah, blah. So now I've got Jack who doesn't want to come to the dentist. And I've said, no, Jack, you really need to come. And then I've got uh, Cindy, who's my hygienist, who's saying, you know what? I'm a little bit afraid too. And I'm, I'm not going to come in and risk my life 10, 12 times a day for 40 bucks an hour. Yeah. Good. And we're already seeing this. There's some clients have shared some screenshots of certain hygiene groups and stuff where these people are saying, I can do it. Oh, but I'll do it. But it's a hundred bucks an hour. Yeah. So now I've got a product that I have to price at $300 uh, an hour or, you know, per, per service to somebody that doesn't want to buy it in the first place. Again, this is a risk to a third of our income, but even greater than that, this is the funnel for 70 to 80% of all of the, why do we do hygiene checks? All of the discovered secondary dental work that can be done and all of the profit margin stuff. This is not insurmountable. But I do believe that any dentist need to have this factored into their scenarios. And we run the scenarios and you sleep like a baby. It's when yeah. you don't that you lie there and then you hate people like me who share concerns. Yeah, yeah. Gosh, I feel like, I mean, I, I'm probably through a third of my questions for you that I, <laughs> that I have prepared. All, I have too long. My answers are too long. I'm sorry. No, no, it's so, it's so good. I mean, I, I'm like selfishly, you know, wanted to have you on the show just uh, for my own questions. Um, and we've got just a little bit left, but I want to, I want to uh, kind of switch gears a little bit because you've, you've always managed to really, um, speak a lot of wisdom to me and you've always been more than generous with your time, you know, for me, which I really appreciate is just being a young business owner. I, I still look at myself as a young business owner and, you know, it, I've, I've sat down with you at, at lunch before and just started to pick your brain, um, on different stuff. And I, yeah, that VOD lunch you were talking about, I remember, yeah, for some reason we were dealing with some tough clients and you just gave yeah. me some very uh, logical wisdom in that. And that was awesome. This last Voices of Dentistry, we were at dinner again, uh, the startup dinner. And we got in this conversation about your presentation that morning and how, you, I don't know, so you kind of made this comment like you, you got up, you prepared the presentation that day and it was awesome. And it kind of blew my mind. I was like, you just prepared that today because I'm preparing for a presentation like, you know, months out. And, and you pulled me aside afterwards and you said, you go, Josh, it's like when you get up, there's, you know, this analogy of almost like there's this cloud and you reach up into it and you get what you need. And, you know, what you said to me was if you were to sit down with a client, you'd be more than able to give them wisdom and to share your expertise with them and to help them. Why is that any different today going, here's what I need, and then being able to get up on stage and give that out? And, and I, you left me with this, this line that was just like brilliant. It was, um, it was something like, you know, trust yourself. And, you know, that kind of hit me. And then, and then you go, because I do, meaning like, you know, you would trust me to get up on a stage and speak and add value. Yeah. Why don't I, you know, trust myself to do that? And, and you've always kind of had this way of speaking those, those words. Um, is that like, was there a point in your life where you not only from like, okay, there's like the financial knowledge and, and kind of what we're talking about, but where you even saw yourself more as mentor, as guide, as coach? And like, where did that come from? Um, there was a period of time in my own life where I didn't feel qualified. And I think this is something that we all feel. Uh, and a large part of that was cultural, the sense of who am I to dot, 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 how dare I, dot, 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 the yeah. kind of tall poppy syndrome, you know? And uh, I reached a point where I realized that listening to everybody else and putting their opinions and experience over and above my own 
made me essentially a worthless empty vessel and I began to look back on my own experiences as I did with the, the, my own dark times there in the early 2000s and said, if I trust my experience, then what happens? Uh, and that was a formative time for me because I realized that I've navigated all kinds of stuff in the past with far less resources, far less capital, perspective, time, wisdom, experience, etc. And I feel good about my results so far. And, and that's, that, that was all that I was encouraging you to do is the beauty of your perspective is that it does come from outside dentistry and it does come from other industries. The problems in dentistry won't be solved by dentistry alone. You know, it's cross pollination of other industries that brings new insights. Yeah. And so that allows us to take what we know and then repurpose, tweak, adapt and adjust it to our clients in other areas. Um, so that, that, that for me was, was formative is realizing that, I have some things to share as well. And to be honest, this is kind of a work in progress because I've only just recently had the audacity to launch a little modest podcast of my own. Um, you know what I mean? I was never, I, I, I insist that I want to make an impact instead of a reach. And so I want to make a big difference for whoever it is that's engaged. And as this crisis has emerged, um, there's been this thrust of, of work put upon me uh, and I realize I can I can really make a difference. I can really help people, and so I'm I'm fueled by that. Yeah, just yeah, like last, you. last question before I kind of wrap up, and, and we can have a chance to mention your podcast. I, yeah, I just didn't know if that. So I think so many people even become uh, maybe have this scarcity of of energy and of time, and I, I know I feel that way for sure. Um, what what's your posture like when somebody comes up to you or sits down for lunch or just even dentistry as a whole? I mean, you've just been so generous with with your time and and your wisdom. Is that is that a posture you take intentionally? Does that come naturally? Is that um, do you do you ever feel that scarcity of just energy and time? And I can't allow that to come into my my mind because I have been that person that's needed help. Yeah, and. I've bumped up against arrogance and people that weren't willing to take the time or, you know, and I, I never wanted to be that. And I, it allows me <clears throat> to show up in the world the way that I feel best, which is leading with love, lead with love. My employees, I lead with love. My patients, my clients, I lead with love. And, and that is, it pays me twice because yeah. those that are invested in their future and creating different outcomes and that I get to work with and serve, you know, it pays me twice um, because I get to feel good about how I show up in the world. And, um, and that's, yeah, that's, that's made me feel closer to who I really am, which, which is beautiful as well. So I go to bed at night. I feel good about myself. You know? Yeah. Gosh, I love that. Lead with love. We do a whole nother show on that for sure. Um, hey man, I, I want to let you go because I know everybody's super busy and your, your time is, uh, right now is so valuable. And I totally, really, really appreciate you being here. Um, Give everybody your your podcast. Uh, mention that also, like if they if they want to reach out to you and, and connect with you online, where's the best place to do that? Um, so, I, I, the podcast is called the Third Rail Entrepreneur, and uh, you can find it on iTunes and all the rest. I've, I'm only about seventeen or eighteen episodes in, and I have had a little break here in the last couple of weeks. I've been too busy to get to it. Yeah. Um, but the best place to find me is on Facebook. You know, just like everyone else, I'm a real human, and if you're a human, you're on Facebook. So. Uh, you know, you, you, you find me there. Um, specifically, if there's, uh, I am, I historically only work with a small group of private clients, but in the last couple of weeks, I've realized that there is a large contingent of people that are not what I call full cycle entrepreneurs and they want to be. Yeah. And so in a couple of weeks time, I'm going to be launching a private group, a small group uh, for 10 or 12 docs. And it's called the full cycle entrepreneur for dentistry specifically. And uh, if that's something they're interested in being involved in, uh, they can reach me and we can talk about it uh, at that point. But Gosh, that's a massive need for sure. The third rail, I mean, I'd love that. We, that, you know, we don't have time, but there's a whole thing there. That was, that was a whole talk you gave that, that another one where I actually have notes from that, whereas, you know, the entrepreneur's amygdala and how it fires and this, you know, fight or flight and we're always re overreacting. And, and I mean, yeah, just, just some brilliance on your end that, that have helped shape my entrepreneur journey along the way too. So um, you, yeah, great podcast. 
I'd love to I'd love to talk to you more about marketing and messaging in a bear market. It's a very very different uh, yeah. philosophy and approach. What we listen to, what we like, when we like it, the colors, the fonts, the movies, the music we listen to. So let's let's talk some other time. Yeah, that'd be fascinating. I, I've actually that's what I've been trying to wrap my head around because as soon as this turned, it was just like marketing's going to look different. And, and honestly, like I I went through the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, but as an employee of a company. This is the first time as a business, and I watched that, and that shaped a lot of the decisions that even we made up to this point. Because I had a sense of like, you know, so we were being very conservative. But this is the first time as a business owner through a recession for me, economic downturn and, and marketing. I think that's even more fascinating, challenging. So, yeah, I love yeah. that. Yeah, we should hop on a call sometime. I've got a, a bunch of fascinating data and stuff to show you about about things going forward. Yeah, I'd love that. Hey, man, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. It So good to see you again. Uh, We were supposed to see each other last part. Yeah, no, I, I will. So enjoy the rest of your week, bro. Thanks so much for adding value to me and our audience as always. Thank you, Nick.